Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the Association for Heterodox Economics 2021 student webinar, our first session. We're very happy to welcome um, our panel from Rethinking Economics India today. Um, we do have today with us um, Arushi Kalra, uh, who is a PhD student in economics at Brown University. Uh, her research interests are, uh, include public and development economics. She's interested in studying applications of collective action problems in developing countries. And her current research deals with the causes and effects of residential segregation in Indian cities. Prior to Brown, she's completed an MA in economics at the Delhi School of Economics, worked at the Center for Development Economics and taught quantitative methods at the, at the Institute of Economic Growth all in New Delhi. Um, secondly, we have Divanchu Seti, um, who worked uh, or is working as a behavioral science researcher and is currently editor of the Cartesis magazine. He completed his MSc in philosophy and public policy at the London School of Economics and a, uh, has a BA in economics from the University College London. And his interests are political and moral philosophy, philosophy of science, and post Keynesian economics. And finally, we have uh, Karan Daya, uh, Dayani, sorry, who is a program manager at Fashion for Good at the moment, working with early stage ventures in their journey to pilot and scale. He founded Rethinking Economics India in 2020. Um, so uh, we are very happy to have him here and is now um, a leading on campaign strategy and operations within the network. Uh, he studied economics, uh, politics and sociology and is very excited about complex systems, innovation and climate action. My name is uh, Imke Meinburg. I'm the student liaison officer of the AHE and I'm also happy to have Danielle Guzzo with me. Sorry really bad with names today, <laughs> um, who uh, is also in the management committee for the, um, uh, of the AHE. And um, we are very happy to um, host this uh, first student session um, with our uh, colleagues from Rethinking India. Uh, that being said, um, a couple of uh, things before we start. If you have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat. We are going to um, organize that through. Um, keep your um, uh, self muted for the entirety of the presentations. And um, then at the end, we're gonna have a, uh, a you know, Q and A um, session. Uh, this uh, session is recorded and will later be published on the AHE um, YouTube channel. Okay, uh, long story short, um, I would like to uh, invite our um, speakers to, um, you know, go ahead, talk, tell us about your topic, which is um, about the diversity within the academic ecosystem of economics in India. Thank you, uh, Imko. And I think I'd like to thank the organizing team for having us today. And I think I'm I'm just going to go with like sort of a brief introduction, though I realize that everyone on this call is quite familiar um, with Rethink Economics um, and also the project that we pulled together. Um, so Rethink Economics is a global network of students, teachers and professionals looking to change the way economics function in society and the classroom. Um, really a student inspired movement, so a lot of us aren't students anymore, um, that emerged after a series of independent protests in economics departments across the world the 2008 financial crisis that came together and we're now present in about 30 countries and more than 100 universities across the world. Um, our founding principles are sort of um, derived from the ISIPE open letter are that economics needs to be methodologically diverse, um, especially when current viewers allow it to masquerade as a science. Uh, needs a pluralism of theory but economics really needs to be understood as it is as a landscape of continued engagement and contrasting opinion and not sort of positioning the neoclassical view as a supreme prescription of um, white men. Um, the third is interdisciplinarity, um, where economics needs to learn from and listen to other social sciences simply because 
more often than not, they share an object of study in human behavior. Um, and the, the Indian network of rethink economics, sort of, well, I think my internet's unstable. If you guys can hear me, I'm gonna continue. Um, the Indian network of rethink economics emerged in an early phase of the current pandemic was very much of those same concerns and it was becoming apparent that a new world would need new principles at its core. Um, we also have with us today the Bahujan Economics Crew, a platform for researchers, scholars, students and professors belonging to scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and OBC communities and economics to collaborate and support each other. And I think um, we're especially happy to have them because they're a community that came together so quickly um, and they really operate with such care at the heart of everything they do, um, whether it's shedding light on the larger struggle or support access to higher education. And one of our greatest challenges um, has been really how working on how to leverage our volunteer base to create tangible change, right? Beyond just awareness. Um, and it's those conversations that led to the, the, the diversity project which you're presenting today and how we've got in touch with Mang Prayog Shala and Bahujan Economist, both of which are partners for this initiative. Um, and I think it's this kind of sort of collaborative action where we're amplifying networks and building an ecosystem around these issues um, where we think economics India is really finding its place um, and when trying to change economics for the better um, in the classroom, in policy and for the individual. But yeah, um, I'll now kind of pass it on to Devanshu to take it forward on the report and I'll be dropping a couple of links in the chat. Hello everyone, thank you to the AHE for having us. Um, I'll start introducing the topic. The, the, the profession of economics has historically uh, for, uh, faced a lack of diversity, not just in the ideas that represent economic science, but also the individuals that work in the discipline. Diversity and represent representation becomes important, not just for the sake of themselves, but due to the far reaching societal implications. Economics through policy provides one of the most important mechanism, mechanisms for socioeconomic upliftment, thus having a diverse set of voices and representations in the field of economics might, enha might enhance the utility and visibility of the discipline, as well as ensure richness in economic thought. Addressing diversity in, econom in economics is important in a country like India, as it enables the voices of the marginalized and the oppressed groups to be incorporated in economic research. So with our collaboration with Bhavajan Economist and Mank Prabhshala, we wanted to study the extent of the lack of diversity in, in, in Indian economic departments, particularly looking in terms of gender and caste. I'll now pass it on to Arushi, who will go through the background and analysis of the brief report. Um, thank you so much, uh, Devanshu and Karan, also for the lovely introduction of the group Bhavajan Economist that I'm representing today. Um, thanks a lot to EHE for putting this together for us. Um, so taking forward on the question of uh, diversity, what we find in the Indian context is that oppressed communities, especially uh, the scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and other backward castes um, have been treated as passive subjects of research without an active voice in this process. Um, interestingly, what we will highlight is that there is complete lack of empirical data on, on, uh, on research questions uh, that, that are of concern to the communities uh, that are under question. Um, and this really highlights the importance of diversity in research um, because when these voices are not, uh, are not given space in uh, uh, higher education institutions, they also do not find a space in policy implications. Um, so the question that we're going to address today is how well represented are women, SCST and OBC, meaning scheduled caste, uh, scheduled tribes and other backward castes, which are considered a historically underrepresented groups in, in higher education um, because of, uh, of the hierarchical caste system in India, which divides people uh, socially and uh, along occupational lines. Uh, and how we want to ask how well are these groups represented in the Indian Academy of Economics. Um, so turning to the background of the problem, <clears throat> you must know that economics is among the most prolific social sciences in India. It has a very particular appeal with two Nobel laureates who are Indian. Um, but there are, uh, the, the profession is fraught with problems in, in, the, in the Indian context. 
Uh, so the first thing to note is that there is no unified uh, science policy for social sciences in India, which also means that there is no unified science policy for economics. Um, and there is a, an acute lack of funding to institutions of research and higher learning uh, in social sciences, and therefore economics is also affected by this. The other thing is that there is absence of data on representation of um, of these of the underrepresented groups uh, in the academy, and and finally there is a, a lack of research infrastructure. Uh, we don't have the right softwares. We don't have a, to do data analysis. We don't have the right amount of resources um, to study the questions that concern us. Uh, then moving on to the problems on gender in particular, uh, we find that even in the in the academy. There are patriarchal norms around women's work as there are in any other profession in India. Uh, what that does is that uh, this causes an absence of social networks and therefore mentoring where, uh, you know, it is, uh, it, is more, it is easier for men to get together, seek advice, take advice, uh, whereas that just does not exist for uh, women um, and, and not to mention uh, for the caste under question. Um, very importantly, there is a lack of caregiving infrastructure. So we don't have a uh, publicly uh, provisioned daycare for say a women faculty members. So there is no such, uh, there are no such provisions made by these institutions either. Um, in terms of caste, uh, just for context, uh, the Indian government mandates 15% uh, affirmative action for scheduled castes and 7.5% uh, affirmative action for the scheduled tribes uh, in faculty positions and for students. Uh, but this, especially for faculty positions, is grossly short of compliance in most of the educational institutions. Um, again, what that does is because you don't have a faculty member that, that comes from your social background, this leads to a lack of support and very importantly, a lack of role models um, due to this lack of representation. Uh, so in the next slide, I'm just going to lay out the data sources that uh, that have been used in this report. The first one is the All India Survey of Higher Education in India. Uh, what this tells us is that economics has the highest number of PhD enrollments among social sciences. Um, and we have roughly equal representation of men and women um, at the student level in economics. Uh, then we employ findings from this paper by Dongre and co-authors. Uh, what they do is that they look at women faculty and students at only the top econ institutions in India. Um, they look at this conference at the Indian Statistical Institute, which is considered a top conference in India, and they analyze women's participation uh, in presentation of research papers over the last 20 years. Um, so this is this is mostly for uh, women researchers, but we find that there, we we don't find any similar research on caste composition of students and faculties, let alone uh, the caste uh, participation of uh, caste in in top conferences in India. However, we do employ uh, work by Joshi and Margan, who, who essentially filed Right to Information Act, which is akin to the Freedom of Information to Courts in the United States, on, um, on what are the top management schools called the Indian Institute of Management, IIMs, in India, and, and they're able to get some statistics on the caste composition of faculty in these top management schools. And we will also use the All India Survey of Higher Education in India uh, to, to make some, to, to show you some statistics on the caste composition of students and faculty in India. Um, yeah. So just in terms of findings, um, you can see that uh, this is just women's representation in postgraduate economics, meaning masters and above. Uh, so you find that women are actually, uh, it, it's not, it doesn't seem that bad because uh, you find that in 2018, women constituted 41.2% of the student body. However, uh, this does not necessarily translate into research, out, uh, research uh, by women in the field. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, 
um, we see that there was a very low representation of women in research represented at the conference at the Indian Statistical Institute in the last 20 years. And this is interestingly, despite the high representation in master's programs relative to other countries as Dongre and co-authors highlight in their work. Now the same paper finds out that only 28.5% of the faculty in these elite institutions are women. And if you break this down, then only 22.7% uh, uh, of, of the, at the professorial level are women. 32.5% um, at the associate professor level and 32.2% at the assistant professor level. So there is clearly a hierarchy, there is clearly a glass ceiling problem here when you find a less and less number of women as you go up from the MA masters in economic level to um, the prof uh, professorial level in the profession. Um, next, we're going to show you uh, some uh, statistics on caste. These are from the All India uh, Survey of Higher Education in India. Uh, so in 2018 to 19, scheduled caste students uh, constituted about 19.9% of the enrollment. Uh, we could break it down uh, by gender and you find that a lower number of women within the SC category, the scheduled caste category constitute the um, constitute the student body. Uh, however, the good news is that this has nearly doubled since 2005 uh, and six. Uh, of course, this again, like in the case of gender, does not translate into research output produced by these communities, but at least it's, it seems like there could be um, something of, of, of a pipeline problem in the, that there could be a solution or at least the beginning of a solution to the pipeline problem in, in, in India. Uh, similarly, for scheduled tribes, uh, we find that it is a total of 14.2%, uh, but this is also up by 8% since 2005 and 2006. In terms of other minority communities, um, for, uh, for what are known as the other backward castes, they, are they, are, they constitute 36.34% of the student body. And particularly, if you see for Muslims, uh, which constitute a larger population share, but do not receive any affirmative action, they only constitute 5.23% of the student body. Okay. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, now, these are statistics from uh, the right to information reports that were filed against uh, the top management schools in India that I spoke about. Um, this was to understand the caste composition of faculty members at these top, uh, top management schools. And you find that SC again here means uh, means uh, uh, scheduled castes, and they constitute a very small proportion of um, of total faculty members employed at at uh, the Indian Institute of Management. And what's really shocking is that there are absolutely no faculty members uh, from the scheduled tribe communities that find uh, that are employed as faculty at these institutions. And uh, the largest chunk of faculty members come from upper castes, which are uh, denoted by the general category. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Karan, do you want to take over? Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Arushi. So uh, going to the analysis, we can clearly see the dire state of economic departments in India. So what policies could be applied to fix this inequity? So we, uh, we identified four possible ways in the brief report. The first is acknowledging the problem of the lack of diversity of caste and gender representation in economic departments. There needs to be a conscious effort to remove the biases people have of caste diversity. And there needs to be an effort to include the marginalized sections by conducting special recruitment drives. This follows the second, which is targeted recruitment. Even, even though there are policies to fill seats reserved for the marginalized in India, but they should be accompanied by time-bound assessments of the, of the status of recruitments and promotions across universities with public disclosures to that effect. Third is mentoring and curricular support. The perception of economics requiring quantitative rigor hinders the enrollment of women and lower caste due to the assumption, assumption of lack of intrinsic capabilities relevant to the field among women and marginalized groups. Appropriate mentoring from current economists should be an institutional initiative 
since there are already several efforts outside of academia that are working towards establishing such groups. And lastly, community support groups and collectives. We need a mobilization of students belonging to marginalized and marginalized communities and their consolidation into support groups and collectives can go a long way into ensuring agency and assertion. Such collectives fulfill the aim of building sustainable and independent networks of support and solidarity from within these communities. I'll pass it on to Arushi for the final comments. Um, yeah, I think uh, it is really telling that we could not really find any data on, uh, on caste composition of students and researchers in economics in India it just goes on to show how little we care about the subject, frankly. Uh, so the first thing we need is, of course, data on admissions, but we also need data on retention of students from marginalized communities. Uh, because in my experience as a master's student at Delhi, what we found was that even though in principle, uh, schools, uh, elite schools were able to meet their compliance in terms of admitting students uh, from marginalized communities into the master's program, they did a very bad job of retaining those students as the dropout rate for uh, students from scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and other backward castes uh, was very, very high, especially compared to upper caste groups uh, represented by the general category. So the first, uh, for, so, so in my opinion, the way forward would be first of all to have a clear sense of the problem by getting the data in place. <clears throat> The second thing is that we need more comprehensive studies beyond a few elite institutions because India is a very big country, and I think right now we've only been able to uh, able to concentrate on uh, econ schools in the big cities in India, but there are smaller universities, and and we need to expand our reach uh, and understand the problem over there as well. Uh, the final thing that I would like to say is that there is an acute need for uh, support from the econ community at large. Uh, we need that there should be affirmative action in um, RA ships that are offered by various American and European schools and also jobs that are offered by uh, in, uh, research think tanks like JPAL. Um, and uh, so, so we think that there should definitely be affirmative action in hiring for these RA ships and, and pre-doc positions because they seem like uh, the natural channel to reach into a PhD program now. Uh, so, so that would help us uh, to begin to solve the pipeline problem by uh, getting more representation in these pre-doc programs. And then finally, uh, this support from the community, from the economics community, should also come in the form of mentorship uh, to students coming from uh, these marginalized communities. And I hope we can all uh, think about what are the ways in which we can offer this um, to, to students from these communities to get there. Um, I guess that's all. Uh, thank you so much for listening to us and uh, we'd be happy to take questions that everyone might have. Karan has just posted the uh, full the link to the full report. Thanks, Karan. Um, Excellent. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, for the participants, if you have any questions, please um, let us know now. We have the first question from Ingrid. Um, two, actually, I can see. Number one, I wonder what you think is the underlying reasons for the leaky pipeline in Econ in India and will improve recruitment, mentoring and networking uh, networks necessary adequately address those obstacles? And secondly, do you think there is an additional obstacle related to economic departments being located in peripheral locations related to the core of the field? I can perhaps take a stab at the first one. Uh, so what are the reasons for a leaky pipeline in Econ in India? Um, like I said, the problem may not be at the admission level uh, because we have very strong laws to protect us over there. Uh, but the problem is in fact at the retention level. 
what happens is for a student, I can only speak uh, from my experience at the Delhi School of Economics, which is considered a top uh, institute in India and also considered um, uh, as providing a pipeline to PhD programs. Uh, so what happens is that after students have been admitted from marginalized communities, there are absolutely uh, no support systems uh, to make them sort of uh, keep going in the program. So what we find is that uh, the, the, the failure rate, uh, which is that you're not able to pass uh, the core exams, which is micro, macro, and mathematics, uh, and then econometrics, uh, there, there's absolutely, for, for students coming from very diverse backgrounds, they have a lot of trouble coping in these classes. Um, so what, what we as the student body at the Delhi School had, had proposed was uh, some sort of bridge classes uh, for students from these communities um, in particular. So uh, I was a bridge course teacher for statistics and game theory, uh, for instance, after I completed my master's program. Uh, but the problem was that this was on voluntary basis. And what we have been arguing is that uh, these schools need to institutionalize uh, support at the level, like they need to have um, a bridge course teacher on the payroll, uh, which is something that they're not just, they're absolutely not willing to do. Uh, so, so definitely we need more resources to be able to do that because it seems like these institutions have just, um, have just are just trying to meet their obligations by admitting students, and then they absolutely don't want to take care of these students. Um, and, and, uh, and we think it's unfair because the responsibility of a public institution goes beyond uh, uh, just admitting these students. The other thing is um, language. Uh, and I mean, mean that both in terms of English and mathematics. Um, so students coming from very diverse backgrounds may not have a very strong uh, background in either English, which is the, the language of instruction in India. Uh, so we need to think about either providing econ instruction in uh, other, other regional languages uh, uh, than, in, uh, than English, but also we need to maybe think about how we can provide, um, uh, how we can provide resources to cope with English because it seems that is the language that one needs. So, uh, so we, apart from uh, getting to hire a bridge course teacher, we also argued for hiring an English teacher uh, at, these, at these schools. Um, the other thing in terms of language is mathematics. Uh, most of these top programs are modeled on uh, American graduate school programs and therefore have, uh, have very high levels of, of mathematical training, uh, which is not sensitive to diversity in background of students. Um, so I think, uh, so the, the debate is often posed by the faculty members as being a choice between rigor, which is represented by mathematics and inclusion, uh, which is represented by uh, poor performance of students from marginalized communities. But we think that's just a false dichotomy uh, because this curriculum was imposed upon us. Um, and uh, we, are, we want to think through how, uh, how much mathematics do we really need. And once we have decided that democratically, we also want uh, resources to cope with that. Um, so I think, I think Th those are some of the reasons for a leaky pipeline. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the second question correctly. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, Divanshu or Karan, if you want to jump in. Oh, uh, I even I'm a little confused, but I think uh, Ingrid means that maybe there are additional obstacles. Uh, for economic departments, department, I guess, because of the whole, uh, you know, constraints we have not in terms of resources or in terms of, you know, I think, it, is it that, like, in terms of resources, in terms of, like, environment, which are not free or, like, I'm, even I'm a little, um, if Ingrid, can you just write it down? I mean, another, sorry about that. 
I think I think in terms of the second bit, I mean, more generally, you do have um, concerns about creating change uh, in, with with other universities because sort of the central sort of Delhi University in terms of how the syllabus is structured, in terms of how what they consider economics is considered, what everyone else should be following. So I think broadly, how change uh, takes place in other universities becomes more difficult because of that in terms of as a structure. And then that's obviously taken up again by the policy side of things where you sort of, um, you have that kind of written down to say that this is kind of what you need to be doing. Um, and maybe that's just a very, very generic overview bit. Uh, but if anyone wants to add on, or if there's more clarity. On the question. I can um, perhaps take a stab at the other question that Ingrid has posed in the chat, which I think is a great question. Um, I can just read it out loud. Uh, Ingrid is asking, I wonder if there are differences between heterodox and mainstream departments in terms of diversity, uh, both in terms of diversity itself in the different communities and in terms of how the different economics communities are addressing them. Yeah, that, that's an amazing question, Ingrid, um, and one that we are also trying to think through very deeply at Bahujan Economist and both at, at Rethinking Econ Economics in India. Um, the first thing I want to say, maybe preface my answer with, is that we don't know <laughs> because uh, we don't have enough data uh, about that. Um, but in general, what are the top heterodox schools in economics in India? What comes to mind is Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, and uh, clearly they're doing a much better job uh, of, of not only admitting students from diverse backgrounds because uh, they had, uh, they, they sort of go beyond what is mandated uh, by the Indian government in terms of admissions because uh, they, they uh, admit students uh, by diversity of gender, uh, caste, whether you're from a rural area or an urban area. So that definitely helps in terms of just uh, diversity where you're coming from. But they also uh, work very well in terms of, if at least better than uh, a place like Delhi School of Economics, which is much more mainstream. Uh, they work better in terms of retaining those students uh, just because the political environment uh, in this space uh, because they're able to offer um, bridge classes or remedial courses to students in order to uh, in order to make it to the end of the program. And the other thing was uh, diversity of uh, thought in economics. Um, yeah, the, the top schools, the traditional top schools in economics in India do not really entertain uh, <clears throat> any sort of diversity in economic thinking. Um, but but uh, places like JNU or uh, for that matter, Azim Premji University seem to be more open to that idea as well. And definitely just having a more heterodox approach to the course material definitely uh, makes faculty and students more empathetic towards, um, towards a, marginal, uh, a student coming from a marginalized community who's sitting with them in the classroom. Uh, but that is that seems like a really far cry for uh, for you know, top mainstream schools in India. Okay, do we have any other questions before we um, go back to Ingrid's clarification for a second question? Any other question? I mean, I have one, but uh, or two. Um, but I have I one as well, Imko. Shall okay, I go? Danielle, you okay. go. I think so. I think the, the presenters, they touched on this a little bit. Uh, but my question is more about how they see um, groups such as rethinking economics or student groups or even academic groups. How do they think that these organizations, they can put more pressure into helping tackle these gender gaps, these ethnicity gaps? So yeah, it's more, yeah, I think it's more clarification question, but what, what's your impression on that? 
maybe I'll I'll just talk a bit and then I'll pass to Arushi talk about BE because I think for them it's a lot more to do with the support systems that you provide and we are trying to move in that direction as well. Um, but I think one part of it is that how do you get students to really critically engage with not just the curriculum that they work with, but the system that that curriculum comes with. Um, understanding that the, the university is a political sphere and the dynamics of that. Um, and when, I mean, our goal is that really once we educate people on that, we can eventually get them to mobilize and then sort of um, enact change within their universities, whether it's across or, or whether it's sort of campaigning for um, equality in certain areas or whether it's really looking for a change in curriculum. Um, and then that's one part of it, right? But the other half is really, how do you create an infrastructure for that to be possible? Um, sort of like, what is the first step to success? How does one properly mobilize? How do you find issues that are important to you? How do you convince other people to join? And I think in terms of really understanding what the other, what, what the other uh, stakeholders in that system really look for, right? Do, what do teachers care about? Why are they not changing? Um, or whether really the problem is enshrined in government or policy that makes it much harder to change. So I think having that system laid out for you, having the, the, the engagement and knowledge provision that allows for them to engage with this properly, I think it's a major part of what we've been trying to do and what we are looking to continue doing. Um, and that's where sort of reports like this sort of come into the picture because, I mean, the end goal was something like this is to really identify the right levers, right? To say that if these are five things we've found as an issue, what, um, which, which one of that can we, can we take up and, and really move forward with? So I think that's sort of a brief on what I think about that. But yes, over to Arush. Yeah, thanks, Karan. Uh, I think at Bahujan economists, uh, we are taking an approach which stems for the, from the experience of students from marginalized communities at elite economics institutions in India. Um, so it was just the coming together of some of us uh, who, uh, who basically were really angered by uh, what our members had to face in these institutions. So the idea was to essentially uh, continue the, the beginnings of a mobilization that uh, one had been a part of at, at, at these places, especially after, um, after the suicide of, of a Dalit scholar, uh, Dalit meaning coming from a scheduled caste uh, background. Uh, his name was Rohit Pemula, and he died by suicide uh, facing discrimination at the University of Hyderabad. And um, that really impacted a lot of us in so many ways. And um, I think that was the point that we decided uh, we need to come together. Um, and I think uh, now our objective is essentially to reach out to students in these institutions and understand the ways in which they need support, they need a community and provide that. So for instance, uh, I can just list out the things that we have been doing at Bowdoin Economist. Uh, <clears throat> so one thing is a lot, of our, uh, a lot of our members are interested in getting jobs in research. So we provide a network where, uh, where we're actively able to, um, to make people aware of the opportunities in the field that are available. We also provide support to be able to apply to these positions and make them competitive uh, for, for them because affirmative action in most cases is not available uh, for these jobs. Uh, so we have, uh, we have had sessions on CV writing and uh, cover letter writing, which has proved to be very beneficial. The other thing is that a lot of our members are interested in pursuing education uh, at the PhD level. Uh, so we have invited researchers from, uh, from not only India, uh, but also uh, Europe and um, the United States to come talk to our members and tell them how uh, they can uh, apply to uh, these, these schools in Europe, UK, and um, the US. Um, then uh, I only spoke about language in terms of English and mathematics, 
But as I <laughs> progressed to grad school, I realized that uh, another language that uh, students from marginalized communities may not have equal access to is that of computer science. Um, so because the discipline is moving very rapidly in the direction of analyzing data sources using, um, using various statistical programs, uh, we also offered um, uh, classes in Python and we're uh, seeking to offer classes in Stata, which seems to be sort of uh, what is most widely used in economics till now. So I guess, and of course, I mean, apart from all of that, uh, we are a community and we're there to provide more support and we're just available for each other when someone wants to talk or rant. Uh, and I think having that space is extremely important. Um, and it, it is not having like, and just having that space is something that is taken for granted by people coming from privileged groups. Um, so yeah. <laughs> okay, does anybody uh, from the participant group have any questions? Oh, I'll just ask mine, but I don't want to go first, obviously. Um, anybody from the participants? No? Then I'll I'll show ask my my two questions. Um, I think you have kind of links to what Ingrid has asked, and uh, it also you kind of like I think you answered a little bit in in your presentation at we at the end. But I was wondering if you would expect any kind of like regional differences as well um, with regards to the representation. And the second one is about um, if you could let us know like how how big is heterodox economics in India in the first place. Uh, can I, I'll just take the second question quickly. So actually from the rethink economics, we India network, we're actually doing, we're doing a research on to figure out what, how much, like what we're analyzing different economics curriculum and understanding how heterodox they are. So we'll hopefully have a report again ready in the coming months. But yeah, because because no study has been done and it's this field is also really like new to a lot of people. So uh, yeah, I think it's still, uh, I think like, I think uh, Arush already mentioned like GNU or like few schools have some kind of pluralism thought or other discipline, but it's still quite in the initial stages, but yeah. Um, yeah, with regards to the first question, absolutely, there are regional differences in representation. Um, and as Ingrid had pointed out, that's precisely because um, the discipline is so hierarchical, like there is a clear hierarchy in terms of um, papers that come out of the US and then papers that come out of Europe. And then finally, somewhere along that, um, rainbow <laughs> papers that come from India, uh, which is very funny because um, because papers that come out from India about Indians are the ones that are not published in uh, what are known, what we know as the top five journals in economics. Uh, and, and, you know, I have seen uh, papers that were published by Americans uh, making it to the top journals, which are absolutely unrelatable, unbelievable uh, by, you know, Indian audiences. Um, I, I, I wouldn't pick on particular papers, but I think everyone in the audience has an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, but then even, even if like considering that hierarchy, that's like number one, there is another hierarchy. So because the problem doesn't end in just uh, hiring uh, Indian students into the American Academy or hiring Indian students into uh, the European Academy so that we can write from here and get our voices heard in, in top five journals. The problem is that there is a clear structure in who from India gets hired into these top uh, programs in the US and in Europe. So I think like, for, for instance, that's something I've been trying to work out at Brown uh, where uh, the student body in response to um, in response to the question of creating 
a pipeline for African American women into the economic academy. We've also been raising, because we have a very strong uh, development economic group, we've also been raising that it is important who is researching developing countries too. You can't have a bunch of elite people from India talking about Indian questions. Uh, that, that, that's just, uh, you're just closing your eyes on the problem then. You need to have students from, um, from marginalized communities within that context uh, to be able to at least begin to comprehend the social realities of, of that context. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is a very long drawn battle because at least when we're, uh, I mean, of course, all of this could be solved if, um, <clears throat> if Indian papers coming from India uh, had more voice. Um, because there we are safeguarded by affirmative action mandated by the government. Um, but but that, that just seems like a very far cry because American universities have a hard time implementing affirmative action uh, because most of them are private universities. So, so I think uh, we cannot expect institutionalization of affirmative action from uh, the countries that they're hiring students from. Um, at least in the near future. Um, yeah, it does look really bleak in terms of uh, the regionalism and the regional hierarchy in economics. Wonderful, thank you very much. I think we have time for um, one or two more questions if anybody wants to ask a question. I have another question, Imko. Shall I go? Or? Yes, go for it. <laughs> um, so actually, I have a, cu a couple of questions that just came up to my mind. So the first one, uh, they're both more clarification questions to understand how, how it works in the Indian system. But I wonder if in India you have any sort of curriculum guidelines that universities need to follow in terms of the economics programs or the content and the structure is really up to the universities to decide. Um, and the second question, also probably related to the curriculum, is are there any discussions or anything related to decolonization in India at the moment? Because this is a sort of a big topic here in the UK of universities trying to, decolon uh, to, to address um, decolonizing perspectives and, and authors and approaches. And I wonder if there's this sort of talks in India as well? And if so, how this applies to, to economics? Um, <clears throat> okay, I could go. Um, I don't think there is any central guideline on the curriculum in economics or in social science. So you're right, it really just depends on, um, on the university's discretion. <clears throat> so that's definitely a problem. Uh, with regards to the second question about uh, decolonizing economic thought, that, that's an excellent question. Um, and uh, I, I probably wouldn't be in a, in a good position to respond to that because I've been in the US for the last three years. Uh, but uh, I guess maybe Divanshu or Karan could speak to that question because this is like, this is a really new trend and at least when I was there, I did not see any such uh, direction being taken in, in the economic department. Actually, since Ingrid's in the audience, maybe we should leave it to her. Um, but in terms of, I think, I mean, in terms of whether we are trying to create a conversation, yes. Um, in terms of how far that conversation has gone, that's really a pending question. Um, I think a lot of things are really trying to define what decolonizing means. And I mean, beyond the, the context of sort of the colonial superstructure, you're also looking at really within India and the hierarchies that are sort of present there and what that means for decolonizing. So, I mean, um, there's, there's a bunch of things to unpack here and I'm probably again, not the right person to say it, but like in terms of what we would want to do in this space is really again, catalyze more discussion on it and see um, if there's places to mobilize around the question. Um, and obviously you have organizations like DECON 
who are working more prominently sort of within that space. And um, I think we, we, we'd love to sort of continue working with people like that and, bring, and, and do that here and more locally, essentially. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think unless there are any other questions, um, we can um, close our session. You have been uh, this was very interesting. Thank you very much to all three panels, uh, Arushi, uh, Divanshu and Karan for joining us, um, for talking through your report and answering our questions. It was very, very insightful and very interesting. And um, I'm looking forward to reading the report on uh, the hedgedox uh, economics aspect in India as well, um, together with your report. Um, that being said, uh, we would very likely uh, to invite you to our next talk as well. Danielle, if you could share the slide for our next uh, AHE uh, webinar, which is on the... Um, 26 Friday, the 26th of March at 3 p.m. UK time or uh, central time with uh, Nicholas Droskin from Argentina, um, talking about the structural heterogeneity and development planning in Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. So if you wish, if you want to come, please register on the website um, with, the, uh, with our webinar series. Um, and if you have, I don't know if Danielle has any other final words to say, um, I'm happy to give it to you or if the panelists want to say anything. Um, I will also uh, mention the uh, participants today. Very, uh, very much thank you to you for joining uh, our, our webinar. And yeah. Anybody else? Danielle? No, I'll, I'll give the speakers the... the the final, the final, uh, whatever they want to say. Yeah, but just to say that the, the link for registering is on the chat and you can also see on our website as well. Thank you so much for having us and giving us to talk about. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, and then, you know, I listened to our report and what we worked on. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think I'll echo the two of them and say thank you again for having <laughs> us today. Um, I'm looking forward to what comes next. Excellent. Then um, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.